Did you know that John Wilkes Booth, known, of course, for assassinating Abraham Lincoln, played Richard III in New York City in 1862? What? Yeah. He was a member of one of the most distinguished acting families in America in the 19th century. He had a brother, Edwin, who was much more famous than him, and a seriously famous father, Junius Brutus Booth, who was best known for playing Spartacus in the 1831 play Gladiator. I will say this. It shows that acting isn't the only way to get famous. <laughs> My name is Paula Deming, that is Matthew Jude, and we'd like to welcome you to Remember, Remember, a show about histories, mysteries, and that time John Wilkes Booth totally bombed his audition for Hamlet. He didn't have follow through, <laughs> which is what they told him. And then, He's like, I'll then he show took it one step. Follow through. <laughs> I'll show you follow through. I'll have more follow through than anyone else in the world. <laughs> but... That's not actually what this episode is about. Today, I want to tell you about a 19th century actor whose name you probably don't already know. And he certainly did not kill anyone. Not we know of. That we know of. William Gillette is his name. You're right. I haven't heard of him. I'm sorry, (laughs) Mr. Gillette. (laughs) But I bet you know the character he's most famous for playing. Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Yeah. I am familiar with Sherlock Holmes. In fact, he might just be the definitive Holmes. William Gillette, an American, born and bred in Connecticut, gadzooks. I'm not sure I agree with the idea of him being the definitive Sherlock Holmes. Well, in this podcast, I'm going to prove to you, I hope, that he is. In this podcast, I will be proving to you. <laughs> Over the course of the next 30-ish minutes, I will be proving to you that uh, you only think of Sherlock Holmes at all now because of William Gillette. I said it. All right. Do it. I I believe in your ability to try, if that helps. (laughs) Okay, so when you think of Sherlock Holmes, what comes to mind? Okay, when I think of Sherlock Holmes, I think of a man sat in a house that no one ever explains how he affords Mm -hmm. and he goes around solving crimes Mm -hmm. and i'm trying not to say a few key things that i know you're about to tell me i'm wrong about smoking a pipe yeah wearing the hat yeah and in saying the the word indubitably and (laughs) and saying the phrase elementary my dear watson Mm -hmm. now I do think of all that, but I do think of the Star Trek The Next Generation face of Holmes. Which is which just is data. data. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit. <laughs> which is data smoking a pipe. A lot of the visuals that you have of Sherlock Holmes are because of William Gillette. It's all, no, it's all in the novels. It's all in the novels. Not Fine. all of it. Or maybe some of it is, but after William Gillette did it. Wait. Yeah. When were the novels written? And when was he? When was this it fellow doing the... It all happened all together. This is, this is exactly what the podcast is about. But first, I can't just go into Sherlock Holmes. I got to tell you about who William Gillette is, how he became this figure that some credit with inspiring how we view the character of Holmes. Even still today, he was born in Connecticut. To... Wait, what was Abraham Lincoln watching when he was... Our American Cousin, I believe is what it's called. <sighs> New York. Blame the British. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure it's called Our American Cousin, uh, which is a play that occasionally gets produced even now, but not really. I bet it's because it's that's why, right? It's not because it's great. It's if it's because being it's produced the one. now, it's because specifically I think people are being like, oh, this is the play Abraham Lincoln was watching when he got shot. Was it the first time he's ever seen it? Does he ne- did he never find out how it ended? Oh, that's no, sad. that's so sad. That's sad. That's a sadness. Luckily, that's not actually what the rest of this episode is about at all. And we could do a whole episode on John Wilkes Booth, but we're not today. His, his John Wilkes Booth time on the lamb is fascinating. Yeah, there is a lot of when I was doing the research just for the opening bit, I was like, I could go into so much just about Booth. But again, that is its own episode. So William Gillette, <laughs> who did not assassinate Abraham Lincoln, 
that we know of, but maybe <laughs> if you think. No, no, there's no conspiracy here. He didn't. He was born in Connecticut to Francis Gillette, a Yale educated lawyer and U.S. senator, and Elizabeth Hooker, who was descended from Thomas Hooker, the founder of Connecticut. I thought you were going to say from a long line of prostitutes, from but a long the line. founder of Connecticut. So this guy was rich. Yeah. Uh, he came from a life of privilege. Uh, I for immediately sure. dislike I thought him, you but that's might. Yeah. my own issue with being working class. Now that's fine. Guess who he like grew up in a neighborhood with? Samuel Clemens, who you may know as Mark Twain, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. If you don't know who Harriet Beecher Stowe is, she is the author who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, was a big abolitionist figure in the uh, mid late eighteen hundreds. So he, he was rubbing shoulders at a very young age then. Yeah. Yeah. I've written here, uh, you know, just a really tough upbringing. Don't know how he Must possibly survived it. Uh, With all those costume changes. Oh, all God. those costume changes. He did, though, like shock his upper crust family a bit when he dropped out of college to pursue acting. Not- and he smoked a cigarette and said a swear. <laughs> So he like tried, he went to two di- like two different universities. It doesn't really matter, but he ends up dropping out. He's like, I don't want to study law. I don't want to study politics, which is what the rest of his family was doing. His brothers were like lawyers and politicians. He decided he wanted to go into the theater. And dude, I know what he went through. <laughs> He's like, sorry, family. Uh, I'm going to move away and pursue acting. My family still don't understand that I'm trying to make videos for <laughs> He, again, he had much better connections than than I have or you have or any of us have. His first professional role was in a play written by his former neighbor, Mark Twain. And then from there, he went on to become a playwright, director, and actor. I kind of hate him. I'm not going to lie to you. I kind of feel like I dislike him. I thought and you that's might. That's just my... I just... That's my own prejudice shining through, but I just don't like him. I hope that through... Some of the things we talk about today, you will find him as charming as I find him. Sometimes on a cold night, he'd burn money to keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> so he married Helen Nichols in 1882. Uh, tragically, she died only six years later when her appendix ruptured. That'll get you. Yeah, that'll get you. And it got her. Uh, they didn't have any children and he never remarried. Now, a lot of my research spoke about this in a very romantic way. Like, his love for her was so deep, he could never love again. And look, maybe that's true. How would I know, Matthew? But what I do know is he was a man of the theater with a close, personal male friend he spent all his later years with. And I knew you were going to insinuate he was gay. I knew you were going to do that immediately. He wrote a play called Too Much Johnson. What am I supposed to think? Well, first of all, you can never have too much Johnson. Let's be honest about that. That doesn't make a lick of sense. But just because he was a th- he was in the theatre doesn't mean he was a closeted homosexual. That's fair enough. No, absolutely not. Did he kill his wife? No, no. No, of course he didn't. I'm just trying to put the threads together and what possibly could be going on in this mystery. Like, there is no mystery here. There's a mystery. There's always a mystery. Who did? What was he hiding? <laughs> Okay, anyway, his romantic life aside, uh, and it's none of my business anyhow, I just can't get over this play called Too Much Johnson. Uh, And that's just me. That's a me problem. That's a me problem. Too Much Johnson or Too Many Johnson? Too Much Johnson. Too Much Johnson. What was the play about? I have no idea. I don't think it's about too many johnsons in in the sense in the in the in the rude sense that i'm thinking of it in the common vernacular (laughs) in the slang in the urban dictionary kind of way this is dick this is roger this is johnson (laughs) you're all welcome inside come on in so gillette is making a name for himself in the american theater during a time when the british theater scene really looks down its nose at theater in america the style of the time was very melodramatic but gillette began to shift that his performances were naturalistic and conversational and he coined a phrase that any actors listening to this right now will be very familiar with which is the illusion of the first time he didn't want to sound like he was reciting a speech but actually having thoughts and conversations as though they'd never happened before, which is, of course, how we approach acting now. But at this point in time, that's just not how people were doing things. Look, here's the thing, right? The British style of acting 
was the only avenue for anyone to get any emotions out, full stop. So you had to be melodramatic. You needed to get it out. People have been, they've been desperate to cry their entire lives. Now it's the first finally to get a chance. They finally get a chance while pretending to be someone else. Yeah, where it's proper. I actually think that is the the true power of theater and performance and acting at all is the ability to allow people to experience vicarious emotions that they aren't comfortable experiencing in their own lives. But that is a whole side tangent. I won't do it. I won't experience emotions. Yeah, I'm I against it. I don't like any of them. I think emotions are terrible things. I think if you can, you should stuff them down bury them down as far as you can and hide them behind a layer of cynicism and sarcasm. The emotions that Matthew Jude is comfortable feeling is suspicion, indignation. Two of my favourite emotions. That and erotic investigation. Those are the three things I'm willing to experience. And shame, obviously. Obviously, to follow the erotic investigation, of course, of course, yeah. He also made advancements in tech for live theater. He designed his shows with naturalistic lighting that faded up and down between scenes, which is, of course, now a standard convention, but it's not what they were doing then. And he designed a new way to mimic the sound of horse hooves on stage. Were coconuts slammed onto slabs of marble good enough for Gillette? Heck no. No, he cut the legs off real horses and had three men smash them against the cobbles outside. (laughs) He's very method. (laughs) His device was much more realistic. I I have this horrifying image now in my head. But um, so he had these like clappers that that would be used against different materials that could represent the different surfaces the horses were traveling over. He really wanted everything to be like as real as possible. Which, again, just wasn't, at least in the American theater at the time, wasn't what people were doing. If you can't tell, I think he's fascinating. You're blaming the American theater's problems on the British. And that's interesting. No, I'm blaming the American theater's problems on America. The Brits were also like, this stuff is not good. Y'all are over the top. Why are you acting? (laughs) You know? I am an actor. Shakespeare's not supposed to sound like that. Okay, let's fast forward a bit, right? The year is 1897, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is starting to regret sending his wildly popular detective over a waterfall. I told you eventually we'd get to Sherlock Holmes. So Sherlock Holmes pays the bills, right? And Doyle would like to be able to pay more of those bills, but he'd killed the character in 1893 in the short story, The Final Problem. It's a bit on the nose, isn't it? Yeah, so he like killed him off because he was like, I'm tired, I feel stuck, I don't want to write this character anymore. It's the kind of thing where you write a mystery so complicated that you've got no way of knowing how to solve it. Didn't, Didn't Mark Twain do that in a book? He wrote a book, it was like, do you know what? There's no solving this. This predicament that they've all got into is just impossible. I'm just going to finish the story here. You can imagine the ending yourself. I have no idea, really? Yeah. That's fascinating. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, yeah, he was tired of Holmes. So he was like, I'm just going to kill him and then I won't have to write him anymore. But as often happens, you go, oh, no, none of my new stuff is making me any money. People just want Sherlock Holmes and I'd like more money. So. He... Oh, no, my livelihood. <laughs> oh, no. What did I do? So. He decides rather than writing any new stories, he'll write, because he killed the character, he would write a play about Sherlock Holmes. That would happen before the event. It's like a prequel. But this play, it's not going well. And at the time, Gillette was actually in London making a bit of a splash performing in his play Secret Service. I thought he was doing the waterfall scene, but fine, that makes sense. A bit of a splash diving over into and waterfalls. Over again. <laughs> Sir Arthur Conan Doyle saw it. He went, you are just like Sherlock Holmes. It needs to be a real waterfall. (laughs) He's like, how do we get this waterfall on stage? Everyone's like, no, please. Please, stop it. You American eccentric. (laughs) So everyone's really loving Gillette in this play in London Secret Service. And a mutual producer friend of the men, I think his name is Charles Froman. He's not important. I didn't write his name into my script. I mean, he is important in connecting them, but... Well, we'll never do the Charles Froman episode then, jeez. So he suggests that Gillette takes over the stage adaptation from Doyle. And he did, kicking off a lifelong friendship between the two men. So as a total side tangent, okay, uh, in 1914, so this is like, fast forward more into the future. 
Gillette was in London for a play, and some Scotland Yard detectives thought he looked suspicious for some reason and searched his hotel room. They found plans for the British embassy in Paris, and so they arrested him because they thought he was a spy. Gillette tried to explain that he's like, no, this is I'm in a play. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Diplomacy. And and I'm about to take it from London back to America. And there's a scene with this embassy. And so I just have drawings of the embassy. So I knew how to recreate it on stage. And they wouldn't believe him until Arthur Conan Doyle called Scotland Yard and vouched for Gillette. And he was finally released. I'm just doing a play about this North Korean reactor. I don't know <laughs> why this is even an issue. I just have these detailed schematics because I want to recreate it on Broadway. What's the what's the, big yeah. deal? what's the big deal? I need to know how to make a gun. Look, that's part of the shop. That's part. I need to know. Like, yeah, I'm looking up the Anarchist Cookbook, but it's not because I'm making anything. Oh, I just need to. I need to know what it would be like to know. You know. Oh, it is kind of silly to think, like, do you really need to, like, accurately recreate the embassy on stage? Can't you just, like, imagine how it might look? He was obsessed, though. He sounds like he was just obsessed with it. He was, like, meticulous detail, right? So, okay, that was a fast-forward side tangent just to demonstrate their friendship, right? But, okay, we're going to go back to 1898, and the two men begin writing the stage adaptation for Sherlock Holmes, finally meeting in person in 1899. So the story goes that Gillette steps off the train in Surrey, which is where Doyle had an estate, in character, holding up a magnifying glass to Doyle and saying, I do believe I see an author. And like, Doyle ate it up. He was like, Holmes, you're Sherlock Holmes. It was flattery, right? It's flattery. He wants to ingratiate himself to him. And, you know, did he do a good English accent? Um... Apparently, he sounded a bit like uh, like how you might imagine like Catherine Hepburn sounding. I think he had a bit more of a transatlantic thing he did rather than an actual British accent. So it was kind of an in-between. I wonder if that's where the transatlantic accent comes from, uh, from stage plays rather than anything else, you know? And then that kind um, of translated, yeah. that kind of went into, um, probably because if that's how actors were talking, once they started making movies with sound... They just kept doing what they were doing in their stage performances. It's one of those things that everyone was just doing it, so everyone kept on doing it yeah. until one day someone realized... Like, this isn't really a natural way to None speak. of us talk like this. So Doyle liked Gillette so much that when Gillette wrote to him and asked if he could introduce a love interest into the play, something that Doyle had previously been adamantly against, Doyle reportedly responded, quote, You may marry or murder or do what you like with him. So he's like, ah, do whatever you want. He's your character now. I guess it's an erotic love scene in an opium den then for Bahamas. <laughs> so while working on the script, which was combining elements from a scandal in Bohemia and the final problem with a smattering of a study in Scarlet, the sign of the four, and the adventure of the Greek interpreter, I throw those out for any, like, Holmes heads. What do you think people who love Sherlock Holmes call themselves? Holmes of Files. Holmes of Files. <laughs> Holmes of Files. I like that. So for any Holmes of Files who are uh, listening right now, I, I threw those titles in for you. Uh, Matthew, I'm, I'm imagining you don't really know any of them. I've never read any Sherlock Holmes books, if I'm perfectly honest. <gasps> really? I've never been interested in to, to, to read I one. I read a bunch of them when I was younger, like when I was like 13 or so. I read a bunch of Can them. Can I tell you something, Paula, yeah. the only Sherlock Holmes I've ever watched is the Robert Downey Jr. one. That's it. Really? That's the only, other than that and Star Trek The Next Generation, right. those are my two two things of Sherlock Holmes I know And you about. never watched the one with Benedict Cumberbatch and uh, no. the one that No, I'm Stephen not watching Moffat anything did. with Benedict Cumberbatch in it. Anyone who went to Eton, I'm not watching your show. Sorry. I'm just not. I'm totally serious. <laughs> Damien Lewis and Eddie Redmayne and all those people, they're all just, <sighs> yeah, yeah, I am. I'm bitter. But it's just a bunch of rich people who got great opportunities for their being rich. Really, to make it in a lot of ways, you have to be rich or related to someone yeah. who has already done it. Although I would argue that Nicolas Cage got to where he is off the reward, off the back of his own hard work. He's the greatest actor living or dead. Wow. That's quite the statement to make about Nicolas Cage. Then again, that's coming from someone who believes that Fast and Furious is the greatest movie franchise of all time. Oh, I yeah. don't 
want your opinion on it. It's just a fact. <laughs> so now we know where Matthew stands on all of these things. I also think The Matrix is the best trilogy of all time. And that Rumors is the greatest album of all time. Rumors is the greatest album, but that's not going to shock anyone to their very core. <laughs> but look, okay, here's my segue back into the actual episode topic is... All right. Gillette didn't always have it good, you know? Because while he was working on this script with all those titles mixed in as inspiration, his original and only manuscript was lost in a fire. He had to rewrite the entire script from memory. So that's a that's that, a setback. I've got sympathy for you there. I, I really do. I do have. Okay, I have lost I, I, like whole documents of things. We've all lost You're the like, will oh, to live no. once or twice doing a long-winded document of some description. Like, well, I sad. cannot read. I'm glad he rewrote it because I would just be like, no, that's it. This isn't meant to exist. I'm like, screw it. It's not meant to exist. <laughs> <laughs> but once he had rewritten it, he finally, he had produced a play, Sherlock Holmes, being the hitherto unpublished episode in the career of the great detective and showing his connection with the strange case of Miss Faulkner based on the characters and incidents created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. <sighs> That's the title. <laughs> no. It's not the title, though, it's... is it? Well, it, it ends up getting shortened to just Sherlock Holmes or Sherlock Holmes and the Strange Case of Miss yeah. Faulkner. Yeah. The, the official yeah, title is that whole long thing. It's not, though, is it? It's not the second one, the shorter one. Let's be honest with ourselves. He needed an editor, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Desperately needed someone to edit this <laughs> thing. Like, maybe shorten that. Um, shorten that title. Could up you take a bit. out 13 or 14 of those middle words, please? <laughs> So the show opened in London on June 12th, 1899, and then Gillette traveled back to the U.S. to prepare for the American production of the show. The play is a hit with audiences, less so with critics, but what the hell do they know? And Gillette went on to perform the role of Holmes in this play over 1,300 times. That's what annoys me with critics, right? Yeah. 1,300 times, did you just say? Mm-hmm. So it was good enough... For, pe- for him to sell out 1,300 times at a theatre, right? Even if that's a small theatre, it's got to be good enough to put on, even at half capacity. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's still a lot of people. Well, and there are other versions of it that start being performed at the same time with other actors in it. So he's like doing one and then like, well, I can't get to this area of the country with the tour, so another production's going to go over there with different... I mean, it was the critics- hugely popular. Do the critics not like it because it's breaking with convention from I think a little, the style of the time? I think a little, yeah. Um, and I think Idiots. over time, it became much more well-loved. It's like when everybody says they don't like something, but it's always sold out. You know? Oh, who likes Cabbage Cream Eggs? It's like, yeah, well, they keep on making them, so someone's buying them, right? They even filmed a silent movie version of the production in 1916, which was then thought to be lost forever. In 2014, it was actually discovered in the storage of the Cinémathèque Française. Française, yeah, that sounds yeah that's how you Francais. say that. And restored in 2015. This is so recent that a lot of my research for this episode says things like the film is now lost to the annals of time, and we have no record of it. And I'm oh, always I'm talking about it now mostly because it just felt really exciting to read that and be like, it's not lost anymore. I've watched it on YouTube. Like, it exists. And these people who wrote these things didn't even know that it was out there. I just, i uh, sorry. I like, it made me feel very nerdy. Um, yeah. You can, is it good? I, well, is I, it good, though? I actually liked it a lot at first because it's a silent film. So at first... It was kind of confusing because I don't watch a lot of silent films. But then, like, I got it. I really enjoyed it a lot, actually. I like when you watch silent film behind the scenes stuff. And it shows you how they did all the special effects and stuff. And a lot of, like, Charlie Chaplin films, it looks like he's really doing all those stunts. He's on the roller skates and he's, like, leaning behind this building that's he's hundreds of stories up and stuff. But then the camera pans and you can see exactly how they've done it. And they have this thing where, and we still use this in modern cinema, right? Where you have a miniature set mm-hmm. and you have like the, a miniature of a castle. Yeah. Like from a board game or from a war game or something. Yeah. And it's painted very intricately and it's very close in shot. but And it looks like a giant castle on top of a hill. That type yeah. of thing. Mm-hmm. I love that type of yeah. effect. It looks, that is always going to look better than a CGI castle. <sighs> so many of the stunts that were done, like Chai Chaffin was incredible. Yeah. Great mustache. 
Actually, do you know what? Do I have this written in here? Did you know that Charlie Chaplin's first professional acting job was as the role of Billy in the 1899 play Sherlock Holmes? With this, yeah, William Gillette cast him as like Billy the 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 porter uh, who did was not named Billy in the um. He didn't have an actual name in the original stories. We'll get into this. Now I'm just all over the place. But um, later, Doyle actually named the character Billy because he was named that in the play. So Arthur Conan Doyle took a lot of inspiration for Sherlock Holmes from what Gillette was doing with the character there. Yes. Mm-hmm. I don't like how this is going. I feel like I'm being proved wrong. So this film, the silent film, is apparently quite faithful to the original stage production. There's a scene where Holmes smashes the only lamp in the scene and everyone is plunged into darkness. He did this in the stage version, too. He would just smash the lamp and the whole theater plunged into darkness and audiences loved it. And that is probably one reason, like we were saying, why critics were like, this is a bit sensational. What's the, what's the lamp budget on this thing? They're getting through six lamps a night. Yeah, like, and he just is smashing The encore is he just comes on and smashes a lamp. <laughs> just another one. Uh, the play is so popular, people start making spoofs and parodies of it. There's Sherlock Jones, Sherlock Jones, like S-U-R-E, The Remarkable Pipe Dream of Mr. Shylock Holmes. It gets to a point where people see the parodies before they see the real play and then are laughing at things that aren't jokes in the real play because they have already seen it spoofed in the parody. It's so interesting. So all that to say people all over in all different countries know this play and as such Gillette's version of Sherlock. The promotional images for the play begin to be the images people associate with the character. Gillette is the model for the illustrations used in the American releases of Doyle's stories. Some of the American publications even used illustrated scenes straight from Gillette's stage production. So when he decided that Holmes should wear a luxurious dressing gown instead of the more threadbare one previously described by Doyle, that's now how everyone pictures Holmes when he's at home. Yeah, he's always wearing a, like, a, like a nice dressing gown. Yeah. That's totally Holmes. And I know that. Is, that. Yeah, he had one always, but it was... Gillette who decided... Oh, this is like what Coca-Cola did to Santa Claus, I tell you. When Gillette decided Holmes should have a magnifying glass instead of a little pocket lens because it would show better as a prop on stage, that becomes part of the visual canon. In the stories, Doyle describes Holmes smoking a straight pipe, but Gillette felt that this would block his face on stage and keep him from being able to speak while the pipe was in his mouth, so he changed it to a curved pipe, which makes it into the illustrations for the character. Gillette also popularizes Holmes wearing a deerstalker hat and an Inverness cape because he wore them on stage as the character. Before the play adaptation, Doyle never once wrote a line of dialogue of Sherlock saying, Elementary, my dear Watson, which we talked about before. Gillette wrote the line, Elementary, my dear fellow, into his play, which was then tweaked by the 1929 talkie starring Clive Brook into Elementary, my dear Watson. I feel like if I read a Sherlock Holmes book, I wouldn't recognize the character. <laughs> you might not, honestly. You might not. I think some of the original stuff, he was he was different. He was a little different. And Gillette took a version of him, at least physically, and really changed some things. And, it, and the play Who? was so popular that that, beca- that began to be the way people pictured the character. Who came up with the mind palace? That's my question. I think for that's you. like a Stephen Moffat thing. You know, who came up with the going into my mind palace and doing this whole fight in my head and saying, uppercut and three broken ribs, repair time, six weeks, lifetime of shame, inevitable. Oh, and it just, poof, poof, poof. I, I, that's what I don't get about the, uh, the Downey Jr., mm. Sherlock Holmes, where he's essentially a superhero also, badass like, who's fight. also yeah. like. Using his brain to fight. It makes sense, I guess. I don't actually know how much of that is present in, like, the books and how much they just sensationalize that for, like, the movie. It is interesting because it doesn't feel very detective-y, right? I heard that Sherlock Holmes was the first person to do, like, what was it, 10th Planet, like, jujitsu. Mm-hmm. I-, I really feel like that was he. He popularized jujitsu. Yeah. And that's... Uh, that came from. That's a little fact you might not yeah. know about Sherlock Holmes yourself. Little, little fact. I didn't know that. Yep. Thank you. Thank he you for He also knew Krav Magra. 
So people really and truly associated Gillette with Holmes. Orson Welles is quoted as saying, it's too little to say that William Gillette resembles Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes looks exactly like William Gillette. There are differing opinions, of course, as to how much Gillette's portrayal of Holmes motivated Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to begin writing the character again, but seeing the broad success of the production couldn't have hurt. And in 1901, The Hound of the Baskervilles began serialization in The Strand magazine. I think it makes perfect sense, right? He'd killed off the character. He didn't want to do Sherlock Holmes anymore. And then I guess Gillette showed him that there was so much life to be had if he could reinvigorate the character. And yeah, I feel... No, I don't know much about this, right, really. But I feel like a lot of the pushback for this type of thing could come from the fact that people who love Arthur Conan Doyle don't want to admit that he wasn't the only person who helped make the character yeah. and stuff. And I think the love for Arthur Conan Doyle could kind of like could admire mm. yeah. the, uh, the influence of uh, Gillette, yeah. maybe. I, I think you're absolutely right. But if those people looked into it a little bit, they would see that Doyle loved seeing William Gillette bring this character to life. So I actually got to visit Gillette's estate in September. It's a it's a state park in Connecticut, his house that he built in his later years, which is a story for another time. It's, it's pretty incredible. Was um, he very, very wealthy by the end of it? I have oh, to yes. assume he was. Very, right? very wealthy. Yes. I mean... Is there a trapdoor in that house? There's... <laughs> Uh, he designed everything himself. All the doors are these beautiful, intricate wooden doors that he designed, and they're all different. And he had like I mirrors. Bet he was a lot to handle when he was when you're being around him. He sounds like he was. He was a bit of a character. Quite con- was he a bit of an eccentric yes. old man? Yeah, he <laughs> he was. He had a lot of cats like 20 cats or something. And he had a table with built in cat toys hanging off of it. Oh. And they all wore little bells so they could hear them when they were coming. And he I had like mirrors all over the house and places where he could stand in the hall where no one could see him and spy on his guests in the like living room <laughs> and do like dramatic entrances. He had a secret door. He did have a secret door where he could do a dramatic entrance when people showed up in the uh, in the front hall. I have a feeling that as much as Gillette kind of rubbed off on the character of Sherlock Holmes in general. It feels like Sherlock Holmes might have rubbed off on I think so. Gillette I think a little so. bit yeah. as well, you know? Yeah. I think so, absolutely. I think they were just meant to... It was just a perfect fit, you know? It's like Cinderella's shoe or something. It's a perfect fit, the two of them. So one of the things they have at this estate is, um, like, correspondence from that Gillette had during his life. And so I saw letters that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and William Gillette wrote to each other. And in one of Doyle's letters to Gillette, uh, he said this, that your return to the stage should be as Sherlock Holmes is genuinely a source of personal gratification. My only complaint being that you made the poor hero of the anemic printed page a very limp object as compared with the glamour of your own personality, which you infuse into this stage presentiment. Is that a backhanded compliment? <laughs> no, it's like, my character is just nothing compared to what you do with it. Oh, okay. All right. I truly believe that without William Gillette, we wouldn't have the Sherlock Holmes we have today. I don't even know if that detective would ha- be such an enduring figure in the cultural zeitgeist without him. Absolutely not. There's no way. Yeah. It would have just been some stories that some people would have enjoyed still, probably, but... There's no way it would be... Sherlock Holmes is one of the most popular, enduring characters yeah. of all time. Well, and you, you think know. about Elementary, my dear Watson, is up there with, like, certain Shakespearean lines that, like, people just say and know and reference. Like, it's so ubiquitous. The closest character I can think of to Sherlock Holmes is Robin Hood. People believe that Sherlock Holmes was a real person. You know, there's a statue of Sherlock Holmes at Baker Street outside the tube station and some people just think that it was a real person because you can go to the house and stuff right as well which we've been into we just went to the gift shop we didn't do the tour we didn't do we're the not, tour you know, but maybe we, next we, time we're, we're in london we'll maybe we'll do next it. time you know and i feel like of course robin hood was based on, on a real person but you know we have a fictionalized fictionalized version of, of robin hood and stuff that people believe to be like real that he was this fox yeah. That was great at <laughs> I archery. I do, yeah, they think he was a fox. I mean, he was a, a real fox, if you know what I mean. 
I don't need to know your your sexual awakening, Paula. I don't need to <laughs> be involved in that in the slightest. But but you know what I mean? It's like that kind of character. Yeah. Sherlock Holmes is one of those characters where it's so much more than just a character. Yeah. And there's not many of those that I can think of. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we remember Sherlock Holmes, but do we remember William Gillette? I, th- I think we should. <gasps> Why isn't a statue Damn of him? It, Matthew, I literally, my next line in this is, I think we should. Why isn't there a statue of him in on Baker Street? It, should be, it shouldn't there? be a statue of Sherlock Holmes. It should, it should be a be statue William of William Gillette. As Sherlock as Holmes. Sherlock. Well, one might argue, actually, that that picture, that we should find yeah. that image of the statue and see, does it look like William Gillette? We'll we'll put it here. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'll we'll put two pictures side by side and we'll see what we all think. Oh yeah, and by the way, if you listen to this as a podcast, normally that's the format of my preference. There's a YouTube video. It's the whole thing we're doing. Hello. Hello. Now you, now you can see it. And vice versa. <laughs> we well, just the podcast version of this if you want rather. So I'm going to leave us now with another bit of correspondence I saw while visiting Gillette Castle in Connecticut. A letter that he wrote to his niece. Gertrude Darling. I am having a terrible time celebrating your birthday. I got up at six, went downstairs six at a time, kissed the cat six times, ate six eggs, and drank six cups of coffee. When you get to be 70, it will surely kill me. 70 stairs will break my (laughs) neck. The cat will scratch me to death if I kiss her 70 times. 70 eggs will turn me into an incubator. And 70 cups of coffee will explode me. So please, put it off as long as you can. Best of birthday wishes, William Gillette. I just thought that was the cutest, sweetest thing. such a sweet message. I love that. That's great. Yeah. I think he is a charming man, and I think we owe him a lot for Sherlock Holmes. All right. I am thoroughly convinced. I didn't think I was going to be thoroughly convinced, if I'm honest. Yeah, I'm thoroughly convinced. I think William Gillette should get a lot more. People should know who William Gillette is, I feel like. I think if he did more films, the only film he ever did was the, ad- the silent film adaptation of Sherlock Holmes. And I think if he had done more, we'd probably remember him more. I'm just wondering what his lasting impact on theatre was in general. Because he seemed to not only be reinvigorating Sherlock Holmes, but he seemed to have reinvented the wheel as it were yeah. for American theatre in well, general. Well, a right? whole acting style. I learned uh, in acting class the illusion of the first time. That is part of my acting training. Um, I know that like, again, the lights fading up and down between scenes is a thing that Gillette established, uh, there, he has patents on a bunch of different little stagecraft things. Uh, he, I think has a, a very lasting effect that again, we don't attribute to him, but in the theater. Yeah. I think it was an incredibly important figure culturally. I bet if I went to the Sherlock Holmes museum in London and ask the people there if they knew who William Gillette is, they might not even know who he was. Mm. It's possible. I'd be curious. I'd be very curious to find out. Thank you so much for watching this YouTube version of our podcast. If you would like to just listen to the podcast, you can find Remember Remember wherever podcasts are. That's That's where it'll be. I'll be found. (laughs) Wherever there is injustice, I'll be there. Wherever there is... No, that's the Three Amigos. <laughs> you can find us on uh, your podcatcher of choice. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. If you are here for the first time, this is the first episode. There might not be a lot of the content out right now, but there sure as hell will be more content. Oh, you can find be. that by subscribing to the channel and that type of thing. We really appreciate you doing that and telling someone else about us. That's yeah. always a great way to help. Give the video a like. Uh, leave us a comment. Let us know. What do you know about Sherlock Holmes? Have you heard of William Gillette before? We'd love to know what you think. Paula, thank you so much for writing this episode. I appreciate the absolute hell out of you. Matthew, thank you so much for listening to the things I wrote in this episode. I appreciate the hell out of you. I feel like you're just saying something like that That's to me because I said it to you it's first. Polite, yes. it, it was did It lacked authenticity. But I appreciate you anyway. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.